with us. We are in the conclusion of a sermon series called Famous Last Words, and we've been looking at the last sayings of Jesus on the cross, and it really gives us a picture of the kind of person that Jesus was. You know a lot about a person by what they say before they die, and one of the first things that Jesus said, what we covered in week one, was, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Even after Jesus experienced the most excruciating pain that you could ever imagine, forgiveness was still on the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was on his mind then, and it's on his mind now. And what the cross told us is that no matter what sins we commit, no matter how angry we get, no matter how terrible we've done, Christ is still willing to forgive us. And that was available to the soldiers that hurt Jesus and crucified him. It was, available, it was available to the Jews who put him on the cross. And it's available to us today. And so week two, we talked about how we are not forsaken. We are forgiven, not forsaken. That Jesus hung on the cross and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so Jesus was forsaken by God so that you and I would never have to be forsaken by God. And then week number three, last week, we talked about the word forever. Jesus looked at the thief on the cross after the thief on the cross expressed faith and repentance. And he told him, on this day, you will be with me in paradise. And so we are forgiven, not forsaken, that we may spend forever with God. The cross made it possible, but the resurrection made it permanent. Today, we're going to look at the word finished. Jesus hung on the cross after he experienced all that he experienced, and he cried out these three words, which is one word in the Greek, it is finished. You know, kind of a bad habit that I've developed for myself, I don't know if it's true for you, but it's true for me, that I struggle following through and finishing things. Because of my personality and my life experience, I really like to create, I really like to start, and I get things done about 80 or 90%, and I'm like, good enough. (laughs) <laughs> Does that ever happen to you? You ever do something like that? It's like Angel. She likes to, um, she likes to color and draw, and so she gets these, uh, these books that have really elaborate, like, you know, coloring books. And I got her a Psalms one, and so it's this big picture with all these little details, and it's exhausting. You ever done one of those before? It's like there's so many lines of color in. And, uh, and so we're sitting there coloring it in, and I get about 80% done. I'm like, good enough. Not going to finish it. When I was young, when I was 16 years old, my, uh, my Uncle Ronnie, he gave me a job to do. And uh, it was to dig a long ditch alongside of a pool building because he didn't have any drainage. And so water was building up alongside of his building. And so he needed a, a ditch that was dug out. And I needed some cash because I was going to the beach that summer. And so school got over with and football practice began. And so I would go to football practice at 5 in the morning practice for three hours. He would pick me up, take me down to my grandfather's house. He lived up on the hill as well. And I would start digging. And I dug, and I dug. The trench was about 40 feet long, and I had to dig it down three feet uh, deep, and it had to be wide enough for me to stand in it, okay? So it was pretty wide. And so here I am digging along, digging along. The first day, I mean, I really, really pushed through. I was really excited about getting the money. And so I dug probably at least nine feet long and three feet down was about how, how, how deep that it was. And I can remember this. I'll never forget it. And it was on this slope incline of a hill. So I'm kind of like wedged in between this hill and the side of this building. And it is a muddy mess. I didn't remove dirt, okay? I removed mud. And mud with, is really, really heavy. So I was pretty proud of myself, but along as I started to dig, I I realized I'm kind of in a a predicament here because I'm on the side of this hill and I've got no way to get the dirt out. I can't use a wheelbarrow because it's on the side of a hill and I'm not going to be able to just throw it up on the hill because it's going to wash right back down in the ditch again. So I devised this kind of like little schematic where I took this piece of metal, it was a long gate, and I laid it flat, dug it into the side of the hill, pressed it up against the building, and I put the wheelbarrow bucket on top of that, loaded it up, and I was able to push it out. Well, I ran into a few obstacles as well. My Uncle Ronnie had a little son, his name was Jacob, and he was a nightmare for me that entire two months it took me to dig the trench. He wanted to come up and play, and by play, he thought it was funny to push my wheelbarrow off the side of the hill back down into the hole that I just dug. I was so angry. One time I picked up mud and I threw it at him. I said, get out of here. I was so angry. A couple times I would make a few feet, get a little bit farther along, and then it would rain and the mud would wash right back down into the hole. And it was just a complete nightmare. All right, He gave me 200 bucks to do it, and it was just terrible. Well, it got closer to my beach trip, 
and I wasn't done. In fact, I was only about halfway. That's how long it took me to dig this ditch. So I went to my Uncle Ronnie and I said, look, man, do you mind just fronting me the money and I'll finish the work when I get back? <laughs> yeah, right. All right, I'm 16 years old and I'm kind of a little hoodlum. And so, uh, and so I took the money. I went to the beach. Do you ever think I went back? No. But he paid me in full and he even finished my job for me. And that's exactly what Jesus did for us on the cross. We are in a ditch that is impossible to dig ourselves out of. We have been tasked with a job and a responsibility of standing before God completely just, completely right, and it is impossible for us to pay our debt in full and to finish the work that God has set out for us. And so he sent someone else to do it. Jesus said in John chapter 4, starting in verse 34, he says, My hunger, my will, the food that sustains me is for me to complete the work that my Father gave me to do. That was Jesus' mission on the cross. I'd like for you to turn to John chapter 19. We're going to read starting in verse 28 through 30. It says in verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. And a jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it to its mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said this, It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. The Bible says that everything had been accomplished. Jesus actually, a few days earlier, a day earlier, prayed this in John 17, 4. He says, Father, I have done everything that you asked me to do. I have finished it. I have accomplished the job you've set out for me. And Jesus did. I mean, for three years, he started his ministry. He taught who God wanted him to teach. He healed who God wanted him to heal. He ministered to who God wanted him to minister to. And now the only thing that was left, Jesus is praying to God, the only thing that was left is for him to finish the work of our sanctification and justification on the cross. He would make us holy and he would make us clean that we could stand right before God. And so Jesus, here he's hanging on the cross. And what is he thinking about at this moment? All scripture has been fulfilled. Now, I don't know about you, but the last thing that I think about when I'm going through a painful moment is the Bible, is scripture. What I'm thinking about is, God, why are you doing this to me? God, why are you putting me through this? And then you start to contemplate, what is your will for me? What is it that you want me to do? But Jesus is so spiritually mature that the thing that is on his mind as he hangs on the cross is God's will. Most of us are seeking how to get out of the pain. Jesus is seeking how to accomplish through the pain. And so here he is on the cross, dying for our sins, the subject of complete barbaric actions by the Romans and the Jews. And the number one thing he has on his mind is, God, let me fulfill your word. And that's a really powerful principle for you and I, that there are moments in our life where we are most challenged, where we go through the most pain, and here Jesus sets the example for us. God, it is your will, not mine. I want to finish the work that you gave me to do. And so Jesus is here on the cross worried about Scripture. And exactly what Scripture is, is he concerned about? Well, it's in the book of Psalms. For instance, let me read to you Psalm 69, 21. The psalmist says this, they gave me vinegar for my thirst. You know, there were two times that Jesus was offered sour wine in scripture. The first time it was sour wine mixed with a few herbs that were, the, the purpose of this was to, to null the pain. And Jesus refused that. But yet, in order to fulfill scripture, he was offered wine. It was basically a really watered down drink, sour wine that had been sitting around for a while. And in order to fulfill the scripture, he went ahead and he said, I'm thirsty, and he took a drink. And I think this is another powerful point, that Jesus didn't numb the pain. He chose to embrace it. And I think that there are moments in our lives where we seek to numb the pain. Maybe some of us turn to substance abuse. Maybe some of us turn to pornography. Maybe some of us turn to food. We eat because it makes us happy and it fuels this unhealthy um, mechanism in our body. And so we turn to all these alternative things in order to numb the deep sense of pain that we feel, but not Jesus. What a powerful principle for us to take today is that God doesn't want us to simply numb the pain. He wants us to embrace the pain through Jesus on the cross because that's the only way we'll be able to find true healing. And so here is Jesus hanging on the cross concerned about scripture, not worried about numbing the pain, but willing to fulfill God's plan for his life. 
What kind of information does that give you about the person of Jesus? You know, we should be more concerned with God's plan rather than our own pain. And so in verse 30, he's done everything that God wanted him to do, and he cries out on the cross, it is finished. The Greek word is, it's one word, take to lest I. It means to complete, to fulfill. The root word is teleos. It meant perfection. It meant to finish the work that you were given. This word was used in Greek uh, and even Jewish, Roman secular history. It was used of slaves who would come to their master and say, Master, look, I've done all the work that you've given me to do. Merchants would actually use this word as well for this, a debt paid in full. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus on the cross, concerned about fulfilling scripture, completing the plan, completing the work that God has laid out for him to do. And yet in the midst of this, he cries out to God, debt paid in full. Well, if you remember from two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we talked about how we are forgiven by God, that it's not enough for us to just be forgiven by God. We have a debt that we have to pay. God is not a, would not be a good God if he just allowed sin to go unpunished. And so you and I owe a debt to God that can only be paid through one of two ways. You pay for it yourself or you have somebody to pay for it. And so we have two questions this morning. Who's going to pay your debt? Or are you going to pay it yourself? Jesus paid your debt for you on the cross when he cried out, it is finished. And so he finished the work that God gave him to do, and he is willing to pay your debt in full, just like my Uncle Ronnie paid my debt in full. But he also finished the work for me. You know, there are some times in my life when I struggle with whether or not God could love me, accept me, value me. I struggle with my own sin. I've already told you about sometimes I really do struggle finishing through. I like to get things completed 80% and I struggle to follow through with things sometimes. Now, think about our own work, our own salvation. Have you ever been discouraged before? Have you ever wondered whether or not you could do it, you could complete the job that God laid uh, for you to do? Have you ever felt like the Lord Jesus Christ has brought you up out of this pit that you were in and your sin put you right back in there. And you ask yourself this question, how do I dig myself back out? That's not what the gospel teaches. The gospel teaches it is finished. If it is finished, you can't unfinish it. If it is given, it's not going to be revoked. I love what Romans says in Romans 8, there is nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. The only thing that can unfinish it is if you choose to reject it and give up on it and say, look, I don't want it anymore. I'm going to choose to go back down into the pit, and that's where I'm going to live. It's like me taking my own shovel and filling my pit back in. That is just insane. But some people do choose to do that. But it was finished for us. And so what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this morning is answering this question. What was finished? Here's the first thing that I'd like to share with you. First of all, the atonement for our sins was paid in full. You know, when John the Baptist first saw Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 29, he looked out at Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He knew who Jesus was. He knew that our sins would be atoned for. They would be paid for in full right from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And that's what he proclaimed. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26 says this, he, speaking about Jesus, appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do this, look at this, to do away with sin by sacrificing himself. What did Jesus finish? He atoned for your sins. He took the punishment that you and I deserved on the cross. It is done. It is finished. There's nothing that can do away with that. And so when you wrestle with whether or not you're good enough, when you wrestle with how you're going to dig yourself out of this pit, look to the cross because the cross made getting out of the pit possible. And remind yourself of that truth. What else did Jesus finish? He finished this. We are alive apart from the curse of the law. In the Old Testament and in the New, the law is represented as the symbol of death. Why is that? Because when you stand in relationship to the law, you are imperfect, you are guilty. Here's what the law does. I'll see what you did. Look at the wrong that you did. You didn't measure up. You didn't do what God wanted you to do. Look at what you're failing at. And all the sin does is it stay, all that the law does is it stands up and it points out all of your sin. And so when you try to relate to God on the basis of the law, it shouts this, guilty, guilty, guilty. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, one of the most powerful passages of Scripture about what the law symbolized. Here's what he says. 
He says, the law is a symbol of death engraved in stone. What was engraved in stone? The Ten Commandments. What do those Ten Commandments say? Do this, do this. And when we relate to that, we see where we have failed. But here's the good news. What was finished on the cross? You can be alive apart from the law. Why? Because Jesus finished the work. See, a lot of people don't know this. When Jesus died on the cross and you accept his sacrifice as payment in full for your sins by faith in Jesus Christ, when you accept that payment, he not only takes your place, but you take his. He takes his righteous life that was lived according to the law and he imputes it, is the, is the biblical term. He reckons it. He declares, this is yours. And that is such good news because we are in a pit that we can't dig ourselves up out of. And what Jesus does is he comes along and he pulls us up out of that pit and then he gives us an eternal reward, an infinite amount of righteousness because of the life that he lived. And so we can truly be alive apart from the law by grace through faith. And it's an amazing thing. That's what was finished on the cross. I'd like for you to read Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14 with me. It's a really important passage of Scripture because it shows us exactly what Paul believed Jesus accomplished on the cross. And this is, this is what he accomplished on the cross. It's on page 961 in your Bibles. If you have your Bible, you get the, you get the joke. We have different Bibles. It's different pages. All right, maybe it's just me. Look what he says in verse 13. He says, When you were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all of our transgressions. You're alive. You're forgiven. And look at this. Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. The law was a decree. You are guilty. But it's canceled out, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way. And look what he did. Nailed it to the cross. And the eyes of the law, you are guilty. And the eyes of the cross, you are free. You are forgiven. It is canceled out, wiped away, debt paid, sin forgiven. That's what was finished on the cross. And that's what can be given to you and I. What else was finished on the cross? Well, God's anger was put on Christ. Like I said, the Bible is very clear. God can't just forgive us of our sin, but he has to pay the penalty for our, for our sins. And so he can't just wipe our slate clean and still be called a just God by letting sin go unpunished. And so Jesus pays our debt. He pays it in full. But God pours out the wrath that we deserved on Jesus on the cross. And so instead of God being angry with you, guess what? Now he's your friend. We get to be God's friend. It means God doesn't only like us. He loves us. And you know, sometimes you can love someone, but you're like, I really don't like you. (laughs) You ever know anybody like that? Look, you're my brother in Christ, but you're not my friend. I really don't like you. Look, it happens, okay? We're humans. We, we, We fall short of the glory of God. But God loves us and he likes us. He is our friend. And that's what Paul says in Romans 5, verse 10. He says, because of Jesus, we are reconciled to God. It means this problem that you had with God and that he had with you, it's done away with. How? The cross. It's finished. It's testilatai. It is over with, complete, in full. That's the promise that we have through the cross. What also is finished? We have access to God. Access to God is made possible. You know, there is a false teaching that a lot of, maybe, maybe some of you have, do believe or have believed in the past, that the only way that you can get to God is through a priest. The only way that you can get to God is by praying to a saint in heaven. But Jesus' work on the cross made access to God possible for you and for I. Direct access. You don't have to come through me in order to get to God. You can go right to him. That's what the cross did. It finished the work. It made access to God possible again. You don't have to go through anyone. You get to go right to God. Why? Because of Jesus. I'd like for you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. The whole book of Hebrews is warning the Hebrew Christians about the sin of disobedience that leads to disbelief. And they were tempted to turn back to the old covenant, the old law, the very system that pointed out their guilt because they were being persecuted as Christians. They were tempted to turn back. And Paul reminds them of this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Look what he says. 
He says, therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. That means we can go to God with confidence. You don't have to worry about your sin. It's been paid for. You don't have to worry about your imperfection. It's perfection has been given to you. You don't have to worry about being inadequate at the bottom of the pit. You've been brought up. You've been given the righteousness of Christ. When God looks at you, he doesn't see an imperfect, terrible person. He sees his child. You know, I love this. There's only one person who can wake up the king at 3.30 in the morning for a drink of water. Everybody else, their head would be put on a spike, would it not? There's only one person who can get the king up at 3 in the morning to get a drink of water. You know who that is? It's his son. It's his daughter. It's his child. God is there for you whenever you need him. He wants a relationship with you. There's nothing that can break your relationship with God. Only we can. And man, this isn't this so true. Whenever you sin, I know, it's, I know it happens to me. Whenever I sin, I feel like drawing away from God because I feel so inadequate and so worthless and that I let him down once again. But the cross was meant to draw us near to God. When we sin because of the cross, it's not meant to push us further away from God, but it's meant to draw us nearer to God, that we can confidently approach God, boldly approach God, his throne of grace, because of Jesus. It is finished. That's what we have through Christ. Access to God is made possible. Here's another thing that was finished. Acceptance by God is available. You know, the early church, they were made up of just just Jewish Christians. That's it. Gentiles, in fact, it was 10 years before people like you and I, right, Gentile people were evangelized too. And they didn't want to share the gospel with the Gentiles because they were the Jews and they thought that they were special. Israel was God's chosen nation, not God's favored nation. They were utilized to bring about the Messiah, and that was their purpose. That doesn't mean God loves Jewish people more than he loves Gentile people. That that doesn't mean it at all. In fact, Peter had this prejudice in his own mind, and God had to make it crystal clear to him. So they hadn't ministered to the Gentiles for 10 years, and so God speaks to Peter in a vision, and he shows them this gigantic blanket of all types of animals. And he says, Peter, I want you to get up, and I want you to eat it. And Peter's like, well, first of all, uh, no, I'm a Jew, and we don't eat things that are, that are declared by the law unclean. And God told him three times, get up and eat. And Peter got the message. The gospel isn't for Jewish people only, it's for the entire world. And so in the conviction of his heart, he was led to a man named Cornelius, who had been praying for days and days and days, God, I want a relationship with you. Send me somebody who can share the truth with me. And God heard his prayers, and Peter was sent to preach the gospel. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Look at what happens. In Acts chapter 10, Peter admits his own inadequacy. He admits his own fault. And he says this, starting in verse 34. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. It doesn't matter about the color of your skin. It doesn't matter about your social class, how much money you have in the bank, what, what, what kind of job that you have. It doesn't matter because of the cross. It finished the work. And Peter says, look, I was wrong. The gospel is for everybody. Because of the cross, you can be accepted by God. That's incredible. And it's without partiality. Well, I've committed a lot of sins. Well, get in line. Well, yeah, you don't know the kind of family that I've come from or the history that I've had or what's been done to me. Doesn't matter. The cross means you can be accepted by God without partiality. It is finished. What also was finished on the cross The final thing that we're going to talk about this morning is the assurance of our salvation. You know, the doctrine of assurance, the word assurance isn't a dirty word. Just because it's theologically, philosophically possible for you to lose your salvation, or give it up rather, doesn't mean the doctrine of the assurance of salvation is done away with. When we are Christians and we accept God's grace through faith, we can be assured that God's going to keep his promises. In fact, in Romans chapter 8, the, the Roman church, they struggled with this idea whether or not they were, they were going to be saved, whether or not they measured up, whether or not they were adequate enough. And Paul says this very important statement. He says, because he's given us his son, will he not freely give us all things? 
God was willing to go to the cross for you and for me. He was willing to endure the most horrific thing you could ever imagine possible. He's not going to turn his back on you. He's not going to give you up. He's not going to stop chasing you down just because you sin and you fall short and maybe you've backslidden. God isn't going to give up on you because of the cross. We can approach God with the assurance of salvation that if we are faithful to him, he will be faithful to us because of the cross. And that is good news. You know, I think half the battle is we need to preach the gospel to ourselves. Half the battle is we need to remind ourselves because of the cross, it is finished. I have the assurance of my salvation. As long as I'm willing to accept it, as long as I'm willing to embrace God's grace, he's not going to pull it away from me. And that is really good news. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. As I said, the Hebrews struggled with this idea of turning back to the law. And Paul says, why would you turn back to the law and give up everything God's given you? And so Paul reminds them, Like I said in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, it says this. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And so here's the good news. We have a position before God that is judicially perfect in terms of the law. God looks at you, and Jesus is your defense attorney, and he says, no penalty for you. Not guilty gavel slammed down. But we still have a progressive salvation. It means while we can stand before God completely justified, not guilty, you and I, we've got a lot of things that we need to work through. We've got a lot of sins that we need to overcome. We are greedy. We are sexually immoral. We don't tell the truth. We fall short day in and day out. But God's willing to give you grace through the cross and work through your own imperfections as you strive to live for him. That's why the cross is so powerful. It is finished.